Welcome to Wine for Normal People, the podcast for people who like wine, but not the snobbery that goes with it. I'm your host, Elizabeth Schneider, author of the Wine for Normal People book and certified wine dork. And I'm MC Ice, just a wine-loving normal person. This podcast is sponsored by my exclusive sponsor, Wine Access. They are having a Black Friday sale, and some of the wines on there are to die for. WineAccess.com slash WFMP. Check out my totally updated page and get 15% off on their Black Friday sale. Mark your calendar and listen in the middle of the show for more details. I don't know how many Thanksgiving shows we've done, and I am going to apologize in advance if you've listened to all of them and you're like, Wow, they talk about turkey, stuffing, gravy, sweet potatoes, mashed potatoes every Thanksgiving. But really, that's like, right? Green beans. Yeah, I was just gonna, green beans was next on the list. Exactly. What else is there? Pie. Pie. Your apple crisp. I mean, my sister really likes cherry pie. I know. Just like Agent Cooper in Twin Peaks. Oh, that's right. You do know Kyle McLaughlin He's in the makes wine, wine. Biz. Yes. He does. He's apparently. like legit, too. In Walla Walla. Yeah. Apparently, he makes wine, but nobody ever sees him. Like, nobody in, like, hey, that's good. shout I out think to it, Shannon and Stuart Right, because he does it for the love, I think. He's not like one of these celebrities that community. gets into it just for... Somebody's, bragging rights. That's true. There's like one too many celebrities in wine. However, you know, I say that and Pink at the same is time, legit too. she is legit. She is actually legit. But I say that, but you know, it really just helps the wine industry. And as things are kind of slowing down, let's say many fewer young people are drinking wine, we do have the celebrities to help us out. So I'm okay with that. If they bring in a couple people into the fold, go right ahead. Totally. All right. Here's the funny thing about Thanksgiving. There's usually at least one dish that most people really, really love on Thanksgiving. Like, I really like the stuffing. I kind of right, like you make the it with mash- popcorn and right. it's all these other it's special things. Yeah, it's absolutely delicious. Why don't we eat it any other time of year? We only have it one time a year, even though we like it. It's so funny. Okay, because it's called stuffing. We try to like go to the <laughs> gym and stay in shape. The last thing that we want to be eating daily is something called stuffing. I'm just saying, like, there's not even <laughs> one other time a year when we're like, hey, let's have green beans <laughs> or like no. whatever. The thing that you would eat on Thanksgiving, you'd never eat any other time. That's the weird thing about Thanksgiving is that like all this That's what food makes is prepared it great, one time a year. Right, right. <laughs> and people like it. I guess people eat mashed potatoes at other points in time. No, mashed potatoes. Yeah, that our, would be our the babysitter only thing. was talking about mashed potatoes the other day. She said it's like her, her most comfort food. Most favoritist. What if I said to you, like, what, Cranberries? If we, what if it was March and I was like, you know what I think we should do? I think let's make the stuffing and we'll have <laughs> mashed potatoes and you'll cook a turkey with her i mean who would ever do that i don't know you realize that people get excited about this this time of year and then they never ever cook this food again yeah but that's why they get excited about it i just think it's funny i'm sorry all right i think okay you know what i want you to eat stuffing every day for the next year and see how you feel that that much i like more of the wine part of it (laughs) <laughs> okay, so here's no, the thing. No, but there is, a, but it's got to be sort of interesting because there's such a variety of food that it opens up the door to a myriad of pairing opportunities. Yes, that's a very positive way of saying it. Also, right. it or is, you can just like sit there with your horrible family and eat terrible food and then get drunk off wine and. Happy okay, we're going to move on from there, <laughs> and I do have a couple of pieces of advice. Wine wise, I can't help you if you have problems with your family. We all have our crosses to bear. But let me say this glassware. Let's start with that. I don't know that I've ever in the Thanksgiving episode addressed this, but I do have to say. Turkey themed wine glass that you no, have, you're going to no, introduce us no. to. No, I am going to post this both on social media and I will post on Patreon. But Glassman is also having a Black Friday sale. Wine Access is having one. Is and it live Glassman, yet? Not yet. But that is definitely worth it. I will do a video of all of the Glassman glasses. Wait, those are the new ones got, that we got. The new one we just got. Yes, they are those are great. Amazing. Yes. If you are looking for glasses or you want to buy somebody else glasses, Glassman is awesome. And they're having a huge sale. So this is a once a year thing, I believe. Make sure you get on it. I will provide links for you guys to get to them. Those anyway, are true Goldilocks glasses, by oh, the amazing. way, in terms of 
uh, durability, elegance, and weight, uh, weight, thinness. Yes. thinness, yes. Yes, David was on the show. David Kong was on the show from Glassfin. He's awesome. He's a young entrepreneur, great person to support. So Glassware, let's just think about that. Sorry, I had to give a plug for my friend. But Glassware, if you don't have a lot of Glassware, one glass is fine for all the different colors of wine, but... I would recommend that if you have a crowd that maybe likes wine, maybe they should rinse it in the sink or you could provide some water and a dump bucket, honestly, which would just be an ice bucket. So what's the most neutral glass that that you should use for Thanksgiving where you might be serving red, white, some bubbly? Probably a burgundy glass, the glass that bulges out a bit at the center. I would probably say that, although if you're going to have white wines, you probably want a thinner little skinnier right. white wine glass. You know so. why they bulge out at the center? They ate stuffing every day for the That's year. That's great. Yes. Mm-hmm. That's fantastic. Mm-hmm. The other thing that I would recommend, and of course this is just me, our kids won't drink wine, but we do give them sparkling water and other things in a wine glass so they can participate yes, in the traditions. True. And I do think that if you are interested in making your kids part of the wine culture eventually, I'm not saying you have to offer them wine when they're young, yeah. but if you want to, I think that's a really nice thing to do. Get them used to holding wine glasses. That's what I would say. I think that's very nice. Also, watch your serving temperatures. You know, I am a nut about serving temperatures because it really affects the taste of the wine. Make sure the whites aren't too cold. If it's too cold, it'll lose all its flavor. Right. And the reds aren't too warm because then I'll get gross and flat and they really don't have a lot of flavor and they're not expressing themselves well. So don't leave them out on the countertop. Make sure you put them in the refrigerator for a little while. So these are all things that are very important to the flavor of the wine and to your pairings, frankly. Just real quick, temperature, like if you you can monitor temperature, you like the whites at about 50 degrees Fahrenheit and the reds at about 60? Depends. So 50 is 10 degrees Celsius. Yeah, 50 is probably or 10 degrees Celsius is a about what I would say for Chardonnays, for fuller bodied whites, but you would want to go for 45 or oh, really? about, yeah, I think that's about eight and a half Celsius if you were What looking. about like a Sauvignon Blanc or? Yeah, that's, okay. you'd want to do that cooler. For the reds, yeah, 55 degrees Fahrenheit is really my benchmark, which is about 13 degrees Celsius. That's a good heuristic. The whites at about nine, 10 degrees Celsius. That's about 50 degrees Fahrenheit. And then for the reds, you want to look at a 13 to 15 and a half degrees Celsius, 55 to 60 Fahrenheit. And if you have any confusion about Fahrenheit versus Celsius and metric and imperial, look up the Saturday Night Live skit, Washington's Dream. That was actually very funny. It was a couple weeks ago. It was very funny. The other thing that as a piece of guest etiquette that I think people often forget or feel uncomfortable about is make sure that when and if a guest brings a bottle of wine, you say to them, would you like us to open this? Should we enjoy this? Let's enjoy this tonight. Would, is this something you would you you brought for us to have tonight or did you want us to save it for another time? Ask them what the intention is for the bottle. Even if it doesn't pair and it's an outlier, you got to open it anyway. If they waffle or they say, I don't really care, I don't know, just open it because that is, they brought you a gift and you should open it. And the last thing that I'm going to say before we get into the pairings themselves are, please remember what I like to call the Aunt Gertrude rule, which is you might have some really fantastic wines and you might be saving them for a special occasion. And you might think that having your awesome family over is that occasion. But you would be most likely incorrect in that. What? Because if you think that your Aunt Gertrude is going to really love that aged Pomerol that you have been holding on to or that fancy Oregon Chardonnay or that amazing Syrah from the Northern Rhone from Cornas, you are dead wrong. And if someone cannot tell the difference between a good wine and a bad wine, save that wine for any random Tuesday night when you might have had a nice day 
and you are ready to drink it and you have somebody who you can enjoy it with and who will appreciate it. You don't want to be opening these wines on what you perceive as a special occasion only to have it be, I hate saying it, but wasted on people who are not going to love it. So this is not usually Thanksgiving and Christmas are often not the times for your best wines because you want to be around people who can really appreciate and love it, even if that person is just you. Okay, let's move on to pairings. Now, we already talked about this, but turkey, gravy, Mm -hmm. mashed, scalloped potatoes, green beans prepared some way, stuffing, or what do they call dressing? Some people call dressing, it dressing. Yes. Cranberry sauce. Some people do chicken. Some people do ham. Some people do lasagna. lasagna yeah. Some people do pasta. Some people have it all. I will just talk about the pairings here and say this Thanksgiving is a meal that is high in fat and high in salt. As you like to keep saying over and over again, it is high in stuffing. <laughs> if you are thinking about, A pairing with salt, and I know all of you have studied and read the Wine for Normal People book five million times. You have highlighted it. You have memorized it. You could recite it back to me. But just in case you forgot this one time, I will say this. The acidity and tannin in wine is magnified by salt. Everyone that took the food and wine pairing class can attest to that. Tannin and acidity magnify salt. Now, you might like that. Great. You might hate that, less great. Then you have acidity. Acidity can cut the fat. Tannin is going to bind to the fat and smooth it out. But the problem with tannic wines for this holiday is that oftentimes they're too strong because a lot of the food in Thanksgiving is kind of neutral. Some of it is herb-based, but it's... Yeah, it's herbs and so butter. No spice, that but you don't have spice. You don't have no, it's more. Um, it's more, yeah, it's more umami, right? Right, right. But it's not flavorful in the way that you have to get intricate with the various pairings. We're really talking more about fat and salt here and how to pair those things. The safest thing to do is to keep it light. You want to keep with the acidic wines because you want to keep cutting the fat over and over again with each sip. You also have to remember something very, very essential. You won't have this likely with the turkey, but you are going to have this if you do ham. Sweet glazes and fruit and things like that have sugar and sugar and tannin and sugar and acidity do not do well. So you are going to have to find something else if sugar is a main component in your meal. Maple glazed turkey, honey glazed turkey, maple sweet potatoes. Mm -hmm. Those types of things are going to require special wines. So we just have to remember that as we're going through. Okay, so let's go through the meal. We'll play out the scenario. Guests are starting to arrive. Again, based on the number of guests, you're going to decide what what glassware. Right off the bat. What? Bubbly. Safe and cheap. Like a cava. Prosecco, cava, cremant. Mm -hmm. If you want to go big, you can do champagne. My recommendation, because champagne is going to be something I'm going to recommend in this show, is either do a Blanc de Noir from Pinot Munet, which is heavier and fruitier, or you can do a rosé champagne. You can oh, do the, the rose same. is a good idea. Yes, yes, because it's got fruit, so it can hold mm-hmm. up to a lot of stuff on this menu. Also, you could do a Montiato Sherry, one of our favorites, a right. lovely thing to hand somebody if they've never had it before and they're open-minded and you've got some nuts around. It's always delicious, but a Montiato Sherry is a real crowd pleaser and it's something that's very different. I don't know about your family, but I know I've got some nuts around. Ha ha. The other thing that you could do is you could do a signature wine cocktail. You could do a kir. Like a kir? Yeah. Not a sangria? No, I think that's too complex. I think kirs are lovely. They're creme de cassis with white burgundy. Hmm. Or you can do a kir royale, which is creme de cassis with cremant or champagne. Yeah. What a lovely thing to greet somebody with. And you just put a little bit of garnish in. You can decide what garnish looks pretty, but you can even put a flower in Mm it. I highly recommend a Kier or Kier Royale as a signature cocktail to welcome people. Or you can take any of the other things, Prosecco, Cava, Cremant, Champagne, or Amontillado Sherry. So now people are there. 
Of course, you want to welcome people right when they come in. It's the social lubricant. People feel more comfortable. They feel welcome. You're good to go. And then we do the hors d'oeuvres. Now, this is when people are kind of hanging out. You might have a table full of stuff. There's various things. I have to guess at what people are going to have because there's going to be different wines for this period versus the welcome wine. Now, you can continue to serve sparkling, especially if you have something like deviled eggs. That's very popular in the South, I think. All right. I'm sorry. I'm ignorant here because I'm allergic to eggs. I'm familiar with deviled eggs, but I don't know what's in them. I what flavors are you trying to pair with care here? for them, but they are full of heavy flavor. So they have vinegar, which means that you've got to be careful with acidity. They've got mustard. They have mayonnaise. And then there's paprika as well. Champagne is really the best thing for all eggy things. So I would recommend, you know, if you're having something like that, sparkling wine. But let's say you're having spinach and artichoke dip or salads and greens. All of these fall into the same category of things like Gruner Veltliner or a fuller bodied Sauvignon Blanc from Chile. These kinds of things are going to go very well. They can stand up to artichokes because they've got the good acidity and greens and things like that. They'll be very complimentary. So if you have a preponderance of green stuff, that could work. Another really interesting one is maybe a pecorino, Mm. which has a soft body, but really Mm -hmm. nice acidity. That's from Le Marche in Italy. And then if you have antipasti, the grilled vegetables and some cured meats, you could go for a fuller bodied white like suave, Fiano, Davolino, mm-hmm. Vermentino, mm-hmm. or Lambrusco. Hmm. I love the idea of moving from sparkling in the welcome section to Lambrusco, which is fruity, sparkling. It might have a little bit of sugar in it. They do make dry versions as well. It's fuller bodied. It's interesting. It's very pleasant. And people very much like it. Some great Lambruscos, they're not very expensive and they're interesting and people really, really like them. If you're going to do butternut squash at this point or maybe serve a little thing of butternut squash soup, like with your antipasti suave, I would also recommend maybe semillon, the aged semillon from Hunter Valley, something a little bigger, white burgundy would go well. And then Another thing that's pretty common in the hors d'oeuvres arena are things like hummus and Mediterranean dishes, baba right, ganoush and right. things. And that's where rosé comes in very handy. Hmm. Bondol, rosé, tavel. But by the way, rosé champagne can hold up to that as well, or, or rosé sparkling. That's the hors d'oeuvre section. So we move, if I were only going to pick one this year, I would probably pick either Lambrusco or White burgundy because you can get a great value right now from the Eau Cote, Eau Cote de Nuit or Eau Cote de Bonne, Blanc, Chardonnay, and they are excellent wines. They're pretty affordable, good acidity, nice body. All of that will work together with pretty much everything we just listed. As we move on to the main course, we have the pairing heuristic. We need to pay attention to the weight of the food. And then the widths and the ins. This is right in the book. Widths and the ins. So you mean you're width have... like as in W-I-T-H, not like how wide something is. Okay, <laughs> Correct. Right. Yes, yes, Spe- yes. Speaking of Thanksgiving meals. <laughs> My God, you really are anticipating me gaining a lot of weight You, I was this. talking about me. All right, okay. I'm glad it's like you're not trying to telegraph something to me here. If you're doing traditional Thanksgiving, you're going to have turkey, you're going to have ham, You might have salmon, lobster, you might have pasta, lasagna, something like that. I mean, those are pretty much the common ones. Am I missing anything? Mm, Not burgers. Not Um. (laughs) usually. I mean, look, if you're doing low-key, maybe. then Tacos. If you're doing something like that, you need to refer to our other parent podcast, right? right? There's plenty out there. I'm not saying, but this is really, we just want to concentrate more on the traditional Traditional Thanksgiving. fall food. Right. A holiday food, because you could use this podcast also for Christmas. Let's talk about this fat issue, protein issue. So there's the Ins. I said the widths and the ins. I'm going to do the ins first. The ins are, look, you got the slab, you got turkey, you got lobster, you got all these things that I just mentioned. Mm -hmm. But it is what you do with that particular item 
that is going to determine the proper pairing. Most people have Lobster a roast... Lobster crusted turkey. <laughs> <laughs> Yum. How would one do that? I would, don't would you know. Like take but take I... out... You know, my dad used to eat the green part of the lobster. Oh. Yes. So, oh. so would you like smear that around? No, I wasn't even thinking that. It? No, because no. it's like salty. You said you like brine, right? You I like do the like salt brine. Water. Sure. Okay, yes. Well, we just take the guts of the lobster no. and smear it on top of the turkey, no. right? No, 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 no. That wouldn't work for you. No, okay. no. I think you like break off the tail. You put it in a blender. So you're gonna brine the turkey with the green stuff. No, I'd rather just dump it in, a, in like a pickle jar. Oh, so nasty. We'll take a step away from the podcast to thank, and it is the Thanksgiving show, so I really, truly, and genuinely want to thank two groups of people here. First of all, Wine Access. Wine Access is our exclusive sponsor, and I want to thank all of you who support them. I know it's not a heavy lift. Wine Access has an amazing selection. They're having a 15% off sale on Black Friday. I've just updated my page with all new picks. You know that these wines are fantastic. We are going to be continuing the wine clubs. You can go to wineaccess.com slash normal and you can sign up for the Wine Access Wine for Normal People Wine Club. And I can tell you that the first shipment next year is going to be on fire. Sign up if you haven't done that already. Wine Access has a team of wine professionals who know wine and they have contacts at importers, at distributors, at producers, and they are able to get us great deals on wines that we can't get normally. Wineaccess.com slash WFMP Make sure you use my special URL so they know that you found them through me and get that 15% off for the Wine Access Black Friday sale. Also, because it's Thanksgiving, but I do have to say again, I am so grateful to all of the people who have decided to join Patreon. We are member driven. Without you and without Wine Access, we really couldn't exist. So thank you to all of the patrons. And for those of you who are thinking about joining, it really does make a difference. It's the price of like, well, depending on the Starbucks you like, three or four Starbucks for a whole year of membership. And the community is priceless. In the coming weeks, we're going to have so many mini classes and hangouts, and you'd get access to so many things. P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash wine for normal people and sparkling wine classes coming up and a bunch of others in January. The classes will go live this week, and please do sign up. I teach that sparkling class every December 30th. Buy as many or as few of the wines as you want. Wine for normal people dot com slash classes. Check out that sparkling wine class super dorky. You will learn everything about sparkling winemaking and you'll be able to save them and preserve them for the next night on New Year's. And now let's get back to the show. Most of us are going to have a roast turkey, right? Yep. That's how most people do yep. it. And you're going to have turkey gravy. Yes. So, lighter gravy. Yeah. So in this case, turkey goes with everything. So you're not really, it's not like I'm going to be saying, well, you have to get very specific with turkey. Right. It's kind of gamey. It's yeah, it tastes like chicken. <laughs> <laughs> it's gamier than chicken, though. No, it's it is. No, it is. That's right. So, what does gamey mean to you? Well, you know, I did eat turkey at one point right. in my life, so I do know what that means. It's a smell, also, by the yeah, way. Yeah. Okay. I don't know how to describe yeah, it. it say, I don't know like how I would it describe it wild. though to, some, to an alien that came down and said, "What I think is it gamey?" It smells a little wild. It smells a little bit like outdoors. If you go outdoors right now. Yeah. It's that combined with a poultry smell. You with know? like f dark meat, f like a little fattier, more umami. I guess it is more savory, right? right? Gamey to me says but outdoor wild. Yeah, I get that. Wild, okay. right? Ch All chicken right. doesn't smell wild. No, no, it no. smells highly procured. <laughs> right. And it's very neutral. Yes, yes. right. But, right. Like crocodile, right? Or whatever else everybody says things that taste like Frog chicken. Legs. Yes. If you're having a turkey with turkey gravy, you can easily do a red, especially if it's herbal. And most turkey is very herbal, and some of it even has a bit of citrus. Of course, I'm going to recommend rosé because I do every year. Tavel is a heavier rosé from the Rhone, and that's going to go perfectly with roast turkey because it is a medium to a little bit more than medium-bodied mm -hmm. rosé. It has a lot of fruit flavor. It's got some earthiness or minerality to it. And it is a crowd pleaser. Would you pick that over a Pinot? Well, that's the other thing that I do have on this list. a Santa Barbara Pinot right. or Mendocino Pinot Noir, which is heavier. Right. Tavel is lighter. 
but it's just a completely different genre. And it depends if you want something more robust, you will go for a red like Pinot. Mm -hmm. But the other thing that I will say, given that we just did a show on Blau Frankisch, is that Blau Frankisch can also work really, really well with turkey because it has Mm. good acidity. It has spiciness to it in certain versions. It's got nice red and black fruit. And that's going to go very, very well with the turkey. And it's got enough flavor. And one of the things about turkey is because it is gamey, but it's also slightly neutral. Having something with a bit more fruit is not a bad thing. And that's why I'm recommending things like a Santa Barbara Pinot Noir, which has more fruit Mm -hmm. to it. Blau Frankish, which has fruit. Tavel. Beaujolais would be another one. Saint-Emilion, from Sac, or any of the right bank wines. Those kinds of wines with Merlot are soft, right? right, soft, still with a bit of tannin, but they have enough earthiness to really go well with the turkey, but it's not going to overpower the herbs, which is really the thing you've got to be careful with, which is why I would never recommend something like a Zinfandel or Cabernet to go with turkey. Hmm. For the unusual things, what about Pais? We did a show on Pais. Right. Pais is, the, Why is would that one of the original well? grapes here. Well, it has a lighter body, sort of Merlot or Pinot-esque in its body, but it does have some of these earthy notes to it, and it can be a bit gamey mm-hmm. sometimes. So Pais, or if you can find the Mission grape, that's what could be more American than that. Another one that I really love is Valdosta, which is the far northwestern area of Italy, right on the Swiss border. And they make some Pinot Gris there that are outstanding. They're herbal. That herbal note with a bigger body is going to go really nicely with turkey. So for my outliers, because I like to give people things to think about, yeah. Pais and Valdosta Pinot Gris. And that's interesting because Pinot Gris, Pinot Grigio is not necessarily on your top of the list of flavorful wines. So there are some specific regions, though. Well, Alsace. Yes. Yeah. It depends on where it's grown and who's growing it and whether or not it's overcropped. Mm -hmm. In a slightly warmer area or warmer site, you can get some really lovely things out of Pinot Gris. They are calling it Pinot Gris in Valdosta on purpose because they are trying to signal that it's more the Alsace style. Mm -hmm. And it is. It's very herbal and it's lovely. But that shouldn't be a knock on Alto Adige because there are some really excellent Pinot Grigio out of Alto Adige as well. Lobster, if you're going to go the fancy way, you know lobster used to be the lowest brow food possible, right? It's It's so so weird. It's turn of event. Usually he was with a butter sauce, so white burgundy, Mm -hmm. Santa Barbara Chardonnay, Oregon Chardonnay, Nachetta. If you can find a Nachetta from Piedmont, I'm just giving everybody one off the wall. It's a fuller bodied white. It is a native white. It is making a big comeback. You will find it in pockets. Nachetta would be an interesting one because it's a little fuller bodied. Maple ham. My sister loves ham. Mm -hmm. Now you got problems. Why? You got sugar and salt, which are things that people really like, but you've got to be careful. So with ham, something with that much sugar and that much glaze. Can't you go with like a Riesling? Like a sweet, off-dry Riesling? You got it. 100% off-dry Riesling, off-dry Shannon, or go for the Lambrusco. Keep your Lambrusco Mm -hmm. because it might have a little bit of residual sugar in it. You can continue with the Tabel if you would like. You don't want anything too dry or with too light a body, so I wouldn't go for Provence Rosé. Beef is another common thing. Rioja, Syrah, Cabernet Sauvignon, those are the basic pairings, but it just depends on 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 the cut of the meat. Well, that and how it's prepared. Is it a poivre? So it's the ins, right? What is it in? You want to match the weight of the wine, and then you've got to decide on the detail of it based on that. If you've got something that's pepper, Mm -hmm. then you might want to go more for Syrah, Chateau Neuf de Pop, a Greek wine, a Greek red. We've got some Greek podcasts coming up. Mm -hmm. Lasagna, what grows together goes together. Nero Davila, yep. Yannico, Australian Frappato. reds. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah. Yep. There's actually a lot of Italian varietals that grow in Australia, so you might be able to make that mm. work. Frappato is a nice lighter style wine with good acidity from Sicily. 
And then a lot of times in these main dishes, you're going to find mushroom-based stuff. Mushroom risotto, mushrooms on the side, things being prepared with mushrooms. And in that case, you want something earthy. At least I like that pairing. Not everybody does. But white burgundy could work if it's something lighter. It can hold up. Well, white burgundy has a lot of body to it. With time, actually, white burgundy turns into something that's similar to mushrooms. Hmm. You also could do Chianti Classico for the earthiness, Nebbiolo, and you've got good acidity so that's going to work. Red burgundy, Amontillado sherry also goes really, really well with mushrooms. It's hard for me to gauge, besides the turkey with gravy, what else you're going to have. Is there anything I'm forgetting, MC Ice, about the main dishes that people might have that no, we could advise them on? Occasionally you, get the, occasionally you get the fillets, or the steak, but you already mentioned that. But I think you typically find that more around Christmas. No, I think you've got the, the basics covered. And again, you're going to have to start looking at the widths, the side dishes. Right. Thanksgiving to me is all about the side dishes since I don't eat the turkey. The sides, if they're more powerful than your main dish, Mm -hmm. if your main dish is very simple, then this is where you have to start thinking about what are going to be the flavors on the plate based off of the side dishes, Not only the widths. Right. Not only, though, if they're more powerful than the main dish, they certainly can outnumber the main dish. I mean, you've got one little serving of turkey, and then you've got all these sides surrounding it. Three quarters of your meal are going to be sides. Right. And most of that flavor in your mouth is coming from the side dishes. Right. This is where you have to pay attention to the pairing, I think, even more than the main dish. So we talked about green beans. I mean, those dishes often have a lot of butter. They can have almonds. They can have black pepper. And then we're back in Gruner and Sauvignon Blanc territory because you need something high in acid to meet those green beans. If green beans are a big part of your meal, that would be something to consider. Mm Mm-hmm. Then we've got potatoes. Potatoes are essential. Right. They're a really, really important part of the Thanksgiving meal. Is it the meal. potato or is it the butter? Well, that's the thing. So you have scalloped potatoes, which are often made with cream and butter, and they can be made with cheese. And mashed potatoes mashed can be potatoes. made with garlic. Mm-hmm. So that creaminess would require something that was of a similar texture instead of something acidic. I have tried acidic things with creamy mashed potatoes. It doesn't taste good. Like so what? Chablis okay. with that. I yep. would prefer a suave. Again, white sense. burgundy, which seems to be my MVP mm-hmm. this year, or Santa Barbara Chardonnay or Oregon Chardonnay. A little thicker, a little fuller. little fuller. And you could go for a Riesling, but it would have to be an Alsace Riesling, mm-hmm. something a little bit bigger with lower acidity. Right. Then you've got things like creamed spinach mm. and herb stuffing and Brussels sprouts. We're looking again at these softer whites. So the same Chardonnay is is going to go well with that. Oak on a Santa Barbara Chardonnay is going to help with the cream and blend well with it. You could do a white roan. That could also work well. And our favorite, which is an incredible bargain, if you can find a white from the Peninsula de Setubal or Stubal, as they call it in Portugal, mm-hmm. or a Lisboa, Lisboa white. That's these, Lisbon. That's in Lisbon. In Portugal, these whites are fuller with Maria Gomez or Fernal Perez, that's the same grape. They have a little bit more body to them. Those can go really, really well. And those are very inexpensive, incidentally, if you are looking for a great value. A white from Lisbon, Lisboa, or from Peninsula de Setubal are going to be a huge bargain. Wow, it's almost like you've got a lot of personal experience with this. We had so much of that wine in Portugal this summer. So delicious. And then we have things like citrus. You have orange and then you've got the cranberry. If that factors in and you have a lot of that in your meal, once again, I'm going to say Lambrusco or Pais Hmm. are going to be the MVPs. You can also do Blaufrankisch. You can also do a Merlot-based wine, but you might get some tartness out of it. There's a lot of flavors that go on with cranberry orange sauces. And I worry that a red Although it will have enough flavor to meet it beyond, you know, maybe a Beaujolais could work really well. Or, or like I said, or Pais, that that could work. Maybe a, a some other Merlot-based wine. But you do have to be careful about the flavor profile. Cranberry can make things taste sour. And oh, usually yeah, the word right. that I use for acidity is tart. Mm-hmm. But in this case, I'm talking about sour, meaning 
something that just it tastes almost like creamy like and sour bad, cream like sour bad. cream, yes, but spoiled sour. milk sour. Right. And it, it really not like is not the gummy a, worms that you like to eat. No, it's not a good <laughs> sensation. It is not a good sensation. Another thing, anything that's sweet. So if you've got sweet potatoes, we're talking again about off dry Riesling, off dry Shannon or rosé. You can go for Tavel. Mm-hmm. You can go for Bandol rosé. I read about truffles being in a lot of things. If you're going to use truffles, then you probably want to stick with wines that are from Piedmont because what grows together goes together. So if you have a truffle risotto, Barbera, Dolcetto, or Nebbiolo would probably be your best bet. And if you're putting them, even with mashed potatoes, truffles are a very powerful flavor. They're incredibly earthy, and they really do go with the cuisine of Piedmont. So all that is to say with the sides... I always say off dry Riesling and Tavel, so I'm trying to give something different. Mm -hmm. I would say Pais for the Chardonnay choices, white Burgundy. And again, it doesn't have to be super expensive, but they do have a little more body, some oak, some really nice hazelnut flavors occasionally, all around good player. Or Santa Barbara Chardonnay, which has a little bit of oak. In some cases, that's even better, especially if you have a lot of creaminess in your food. Mm-hmm. So that's a departure from my off-dry Riesling and Tavel, which I still 100% approve of, by the way. It's just that I'm trying to give you some different things. Dessert wine. Most people forget about dessert wine. They don't want to do dessert wine. If you want to do a dessert wine, you got pumpkin pie. You could go for Pedro Jimenez Sherry. Mm-hmm. You could go for Moscato d'Asti. Got him really hammering Wait, on Piedmont. Pe- Pedro Jimenez Sherry. Isn't that what we had with ice cream? Yes. Too? Yes. So yes. something like pumpkin pie, which I know you hate it because it made you throw up as a child. Not, not exactly, but it's safe to say I'm not a fan. Yeah. But you do have to admit it kind of smells good because it's got a lot of cinnamon in it. Yes, it does. That's And right. the pumpkin is fresh smelling. Yes. Pumpkin pie and Pedro Jimenez sherry are a great match. Or Moscato d'Asti. The thing I like about Moscato d'Asti is it's a little bit effervescent. Mm -hmm. Lower alcohol, good acidity, a bit grapey. It goes really nicely with cakes. It's delicious. Moscato d'Asti is Hmm. great with cakes. The rule with dessert wines is that it has to be as sweet as or sweeter than the dessert in order for it to work. And it has to have good acidity. So like if you've got cherry pie, I guess I should buy my sister a late harvest Zinfandel. That would work well. Way to ruin the surprise now. She doesn't listen to the show. (laughs) She just asks me stuff about wine. She'll never listen. Okay, what about the cab with my chocolate dessert? No, no, no. you got to get out Bonules or Ruby Port, which is easy. What about apple pie, though? Yeah. What are you going to do about apple pie? Mm. What is the most American European wine? Most American European wine. We toasted the Declaration of Independence with Madeira. Madeira. So a Boal Madeira and apple pie are perfect. Now, if you buy the Madeira and nobody wants it, who cares? You can keep that open for six months a year and you're good to go. Yeah, well, it's already been baked. What what does it matter? That's a great investment of, hey, you know what? Maybe some people will want the apple pie with Boel Madeira. Right. But if they don't, I'll just have it with a dessert some other time or Mm. as dessert another time. It's caramelized. It's delicious. Nice. That's a really great investment. That being said, for about... 15 U.S. dollars, yeah. Moscato Dosti is definitely my pick for an all-arounder. I think it's a crowd pleaser. It's pretty low alcohol, not very high sugar, and it's a really nice, refreshing way to end the meal. If you want my final menu for this year, Cure Royale, because I freaking love Cure Royale, yeah. or Champagne to start, Rosé Champagne, then Lambrusco, And that white burgundy, which you're just going to keep all throughout the meal. You could also keep the Lambrusco throughout the meal. And then for the main course, depending on what you're having, of course, always Tavel is on the menu. Maybe some Merlot, that white white burgundy, though, shines through again, or Santa Barbara Chardonnay or Oregon Chardonnay. And then Pais is the other choice for me. So there we go. Kind of random stuff this year, but I figured I would try some different things. Hopefully you will be able to source some of these wines. You have time to poke around, go on winesearcher.com, see if there's any of these wines around you. You'd be surprised. I'm always, people are always surprised. Wow, I didn't know that store was around and had that wine. Mm -hmm. So check it out. 
And you know what? Go with the safe bets if you want. Go with the off-dry Riesling. Go with the Tavel. Go with the white Burgundy and the sparkling. And I'd add the Moscato d'Asti for dessert. But pick one of these rando wines and try it out. And then please report back to us and let us know what you think. Because I think it's fun to do some experimentation, especially with a grape like Pais, which has been here for so long. It's been... We think it's been in the Americas since the 1500s. That's kind of a fun way to celebrate the American heritage of that grape. Madeira as well, which has been with us basically since the beginning. There's lots to be said for these historic wines. And then also there's a lot to be said for the flavor of them too. I would just like to thank everybody who has given us nearly 13 years Oh of God, the show. We started crazy. in 2011. It's almost 2024. 20, that's so crazy. And we just appreciate your loyalty. We appreciate you going along with all the new ventures and the stuff that I've put out and changed. And you guys are so flexible and so wonderful. So every year at our Thanksgiving table, we do give thanks we do. to you. Really. Cheers to all of you. Absolutely. How did you start this when you were 12, by the way? I know. It's really amazing. I know. It really is. But you know what? Seriously, you know what I was thinking? Because you've been able to do so many more hangouts recently. So instead of doing a a Friendsgiving, we could do like a a virtual patrons giving. That would be so fun if we did it early enough. We had people from all over the world. And everyone could have like different wines and food combinations. We all compare notes and just hang out all night. That'd be awesome. Can we just do that this year? (laughs) We're going to be driving forever. No, let's plan that. That would be super that would fun. Be great. Yes. And then we can well, all let us know if that would be of interest to anyone else out there. On Patreon, you can put it in the show notes and let us know. And that's another reason to join Patreon if you haven't done it. We will be doing a Patreon Thanksgiving hangout like we do every year this year, but it would be fun if it were on the on day of things, Thanksgiving. Right? Yes. I mean, yeah, if we were not, weren't traveling, we don't go every year. Right. That's a great idea, MCI. I said, love it. So stay tuned for Thanksgiving 2024. Maybe we'll do it then. Who knows? We'll try. Yeah, we'll see what we could do. Anyway, we are super grateful to you. And wherever you are and whatever you're doing on Thanksgiving, just know that we are thinking of you. We appreciate you. And please give a toast to yourself. Know that we'll be toasting you and enjoy the wine. Get something that is tasty. It does not need to be expensive, given the Aunt Gertrude rule. (laughs) Right. I mean, friends, family, food, and wine, you can't beat it. And with that, this has been another episode of Wine for Normal People. Thank you so much for listening, and we will catch you next time.